So Dembski, one of the other uh, strong proponents of ID, uh, wrote a few years ago in a defense of ID, and I think it's a very credible way to respond, and I give him a lot of credit for saying it so clearly. If it could be shown that biological systems that are wonderfully complex, elegant, and integrated, such as the bacterial flagellum, could have been formed by a gradual Darwinian process, and thus that their specified complexity is an illusion. Then intelligent design would be refuted on the general grounds that one does not invoke intelligent causes when undirected natural causes will do. Most of us looking at the story of the flagellum and many others would say that time has arrived. And intelligent design for all of its attractiveness as a defense against atheistic evolution and therefore being embraced by many churches is in fact a God of the gaps theory. It's a theory that says, here's something we can't quite explain with current knowledge. That must be where God has acted. Those theories have not fared well down through history. Uh, this one is not going to fare well either. God's plan included the mechanism of evolution. That was his creative genius, to create the marvelous diversity of living things on our planet. And that included, most especially, human beings. After evolution over this long period of time had prepared a sufficiently advanced house, the human brain, with all of its uh, neurological complexity, then God gifted humanity with something special that makes us different from all the animals, the knowledge of good and evil, the moral law, with free will, which is not an illusion, and with a soul. All right. So let's deal with the moral law. Uh, so those of us that have had a close association with large farm animals or, or household pets, uh, would have a hard time believing that morality has been excluded completely from animals. Mm -hmm. Though we would all agree that there's a quantitative difference between what we observe in humans versus what we observe in, in, in animals. So would there be observations that could be made from animal behavior or a study of, of, of animals in nature that would temper your conviction that the moral law might be something that's uniquely human? It's a great question. and. Uh, Again, this gets into an interesting intersection uh, between biology, evolution, and moral philosophy uh, because it requires you to decide what really is an evidence of moral behavior as opposed to some other related behavior such as displaying empathy. I think we do have evidence from experimentation and Franz Duval has done a lot of this with primates that animals, uh, primates, and it, certainly dogs, uh, even mice, are capable of demonstrating something that looks like empathy at the suffering of another animal of their same species. Or for instance, there are experiments where a, a monkey will avoid uh, delivering a shock to a companion even if that's going to provide uh, uh, some food benefit. So there is something there that has some relationship to moral behavior. And I'm not a philosopher, but I think most moral philosophers would say that's not the whole thing. You don't really have a full-blown sense of morality unless you also bring judgment and reason uh, into the picture. And it is not clear that judgment and reason are participating in these other animal demonstrations. Again, I don't think I'm particularly shaken up by the idea that evolution would have provided some of the neurological hardware necessary for building a foundation that could become, in us humans, something we call the moral law, which has all of these other components to it, uh, it would make sort of sense, in fact, that you wouldn't have to invent this uh, in some supernatural way out of a uh, whole cloth, but that you would want to provide some components of this along the way, just as you'd want to provide components for consciousness, for the ability to have free will, and so on. But I, I come back to the fact that the moral law uh, glimmers that one sees in animals do not rise to the level of this scandalous kind of radical altruism, which seems to me to be the strongest indication that there's something going on here that evolution alone cannot fully explain about human spirit and human nature. Uh, not a proof, uh, just a, a cause for serious thought and something that very serious thinkers have been wrestling with. And I would say if you encounter sociobiologists uh, who are arguing that this is a solved problem, 
That's just not the case. There's some very interesting explorations going on, but it's not the case. You've made a good argument that pure altruism doesn't fit with classic evolutionary theory when you're saving a genome that's not related to your own. Right. Would you entertain cultural evolution as being a foundation for the origin of, of altruism where the first culture that stumbles upon this behavior by accident has increased fitness as a culture and our evolutionary principles would then apply? Right. So this then gets us into the question of what is the unit upon which evolution operates? Is it the individual or is it the group? And uh, recently, after sort of the individual having great prominence in evolutionary theory, the group is sort of making a comeback. But that's largely based upon some very interesting game theory uh, approaches uh, that people like Martin Nowak at Harvard uh, have been pursuing. Interestingly, Martin Nowak, uh, the author of these game theories, is also a very serious believer and doesn't think that they undercut this at all, but some of his uh, readers seem to think it does. Basically, game theory sort of like the prisoner's dilemma, only more complicated, arguing that a group that behaves in a certain altruistic way together has better long-term benefit in terms of their survival. Um, there's a problem with that, though, because if this is the case, then the group, by definition, also has to, while supporting the members of the group, also try not uh, to support people who are outside the group. In fact, need to behave belligerently towards people outside the group or the whole thing falls apart. And our examples of radical altruism are exactly that, where the altruism is extended to people way outside the group, and yet we still see that as noble, as admirable, as something that we should all try to do. It falls apart in that situation.